Um, so anyway, so, so we're gonna have a chin chin. Ooh, ooh, <laughs> ooh. We having, what are you drinking? We're drinking a it's mute. Fritz. So we're gonna cook artichokes tonight. Hang on a second. We're gonna mm, cook chinar. And so we're having some chinar, yes, uh, which is a kind of an amaro, which is a bitter alcohol that is made out of artichokes, and we've mixed it with some uh, local prosecco. Oh, that's our spritz. Love prosecco. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. All right. Lorenzo's going to go into See his little later. hovel. He'll be back. He's supposed to. <laughs> he takes the bottle. He'll be back to cook. Um, Lorenzo de Bianchi Mutari Tutti. Okay, good. All right, so we're going to get started. Um, we still have some people signing in, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. First of all, I just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. We have a big group tonight, and I appreciate everybody who's invited friends. And um, I appreciate all of y'all who are friends of Cousin Adri for popping in tonight. So I was talking to Adri this week, and um, we thought it would be fun if um, some of y'all came and saw what was going on over here in Italy. So thank y'all so much for popping in. And um, one second, I'm getting my screen shared. Here we go. Okay. I'm about to share my screen, but first, I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody who has donated for this program. Um, I think y'all realize your donations cover 100% of our production costs. So Lorenzo and I are really both extremely grateful to y'all for your generosity on that front. Um, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen. This takes me a second portion. Here we go. Okay. Um, so for everybody who has just tuned in, I don't know what I just did, Lorenzo. I have done an error here. Gone. Okay, hang on two seconds. There we go. Okay, now we can start. So we are going to um, take a visit to Italy. Um, I am Elaine Trigiani, and I am an um, art historian. I'm from the United States, and I worked at the National Gallery of Art for 10 years before moving to Italy. And I have been working in food and wine tourism and education for about 20 years. Um, say quoi? Oh, because he's freedom. Okay, sorry, technical difficulties. Um, so I have been living in Italy for 20 years. I work in food and wine, um, tourism and education, and I design culinary travel programs. Um, however, during the pandemic, I've had to kind of reimagine all of that. And so we're making virtual visits. Um, I work with Lorenzo, who y'all just saw a second ago. He's our tech support guy and also a food support guy. Lorenzo, say hello. Hi, hi. Here he is. Hi, everybody. Hello, everybody. Okay. <laughs> So Hello. Lorenzo's here tonight. Lorenzo is actually often um, not uh, on site, so that's kind of a fun surprise for everybody. Um, so today we are going to go to Rome, and we are going to take a look at um, the artist who is known as Raphael. His name is Raffaele, Raffaele, Raffaello Sanzio, excuse me, known as Raphael in English. He's from Urbina. You can see that on the map. We are going to talk about, really focus on the intersection of his work with the great high renaissance patron pope julius ii della rovere the della rovere family is from up near savona you can see that on the upper part of the uh, northwest um, corner of italy um, and then you can also see marked on the map the city of florence so um, raffaello went from urbino to florence before he got to rome and then the two smaller dots on the map are where i live and where i work so i'm just going to show y'all quickly um, uh, where I'm coming from, so I'll kind of have an idea. So this is where I live, southwest of Florence. This is the castle of Popiano. And um, I actually, I rent from uh, the Count and Countess who live in the castle. And the view you see there on the right was taken from the taller tower of the castle. Um, still uh, the view from the taller tower of the castle, you can see down into the Borgo here. This is just this little clutch of houses right outside the castle walls. This is my house, this is my chimney. There's my fire, so there's smoke coming out of the chimney right now. <clears throat> See. See, oh not do not vedo. Devi venire qua. Excuse me, we have a little tech difficulty. One second. Sorry. I don't know where it is. Un'attimo solo. One one second only. Where are you? Sorry, we're having just a little tech difficulty. 
ma devi essere per forza host. Per fare muto, stra- eccetera, sì. Perché non stai dietro ecco, di ecco, me? Ecco, ecco, ecco. Ok. Here ah, we go. Okay, are we done? No, wait. <laughs> We're not done yet. Hang on one second. Lorenzo is doing whatever he's done. I don't know. We have some tech, little, little tech stuff going on here. Co-host. Yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Back to it. So what I'm trying to say is that's my house there on the right. Okay. So uh, back to the map here. So we are going to go to Rome in just one second. This is Florence. This is where I live. I'm going to just show y'all briefly um, a farm that I collaborate with, which is located right here to the south of Florence. And this is the farm called Sagona. And at Sagona, we make, we have a little farm restaurant. We make uh, wine and olive oil, and I collaborate on the olive oil end. Some of y'all have made comments uh, to that end. Thank you very much. And here we are in our olive mill. Um, this is my colleague, Daniele, making olive oil. And um, I'm quite proud of our olive oil. And I know a lot of y'all on the line have tasted it. So uh, thanks for your compliments. Um, all right, let's jump to Urbino. Here we go. So we're going to talk about this artist, Raffaele Sanzio. He's born in Urbino in 1483. He really just goes by the, we call him Raffaele in English, just his first name. Um, his father was court painter to the po- um, the duke of urbino uh the uh, federico da montefeltro he has that very um kind of particular profile which i think a lot of y'all have probably seen that's a painting by piero della francesca which is actually on the cover of a new novel that just came out it's called the duke so there's a, there's this new novel and i'm sure it's kind of spicy about uh, federico da montefeltro so Raphael was born into this court um, and surely learned to paint from his father Um, Unfortunately for him, his father died when he was 11 and his mother had passed away when he was eight. So he was actually orphaned at age 11 and kind of caught up between um, his widowed stepmother and then his uncles who really looked out for him in his best interest. So we don't have a lot of information about Raphael's very early, early years, but he seems to um, have received a very good humanist education. He easily navigates life at court. He is friends with the kind of the poets and philosophers at court. He um, is comfortable with his patrons who are poets and cardinals. Um, and he was kind of on the fast track. By age 15, he was listed as an independent painter, which means not only can he paint, and he of course can paint, but he has been, uh, at that age, he was able to accept independent commissions. That meant that he could interpret subject matter and he could deal with clients. And he was dealing with these super high level clients such as the um, Duke of Urbino. So just let's just take a look at some early works of uh, Raphael. So here is a work that he painted. This, the, what you're seeing in the very center is the Incarnation of the Virgin. That's today in the Pinacoteca of the Vatican, painted by Raphael when he was about 19 years old. So it's an extremely early work. And you can see that he's really under the influence of Perugino. Perugino is an early Renaissance master from Urbino. And um, he was an extremely well-known, famous, successful painter. Um, And you can kind of see the influence he had over Raphael here. Um, What's kind of nice about this painting really is it's very linear. The drawing is quite nice. There's this beautiful, clear light. Um, Raphael's even included this kind of oblique angle here of the um, empty tomb of the Virgin. The, The deal is the Virgin has ascended into heaven and she's being crowned by Christ. So, um it is a nice painting it's a little bit kind of cut in half by this little kind of sharp cloud that all the figures are standing on and then if you notice kind of what he's gotten from perugino um the poses of the figures are a little bit static and they're all sort of standing like this which is sort of classic perugino it's like your clue in art history 101 if everybody's going like that that means it's perugino or maybe early Raphael. And you can see that here in early Raphael. And then also the figures at the top, even though they're very nicely drawn, there's a little bit of movement in their drapery, these angels, for example, they're a little bit like cut out paper dolls. So looking at them from today's eyes, the effect is a little bit static. So yes, Raphael definitely um, had learned how to paint. And he was collaborating here with Perugino, who for the prior generation actually was, as I said, a very successful artist. He'd been called to Rome even to um, contribute to decoration in the Vatican. But uh, Raphael at age 19 had kind of a lot more um, to kind of develop his style. So at age 20-ish, he went to Florence and he had 
um, he was moving there kind of to further his career. He had a glowing letter of recommendation from the Duke of Urbino. And he moves to Florence and he comes into contact with the proponents of high Renaissance painting. So he's kind of, these are kind of the heavy hitters of high Renaissance painting. Um, his elder Leonardo, who you can see on the left, this is the Madonna in St. Anne from 1503. It's in the Louvre. Fra Bartolomeo, who was just a few years older than him. This is Christ uh, in the Evangelist. This was actually painted a couple years later. It's in Palazzo Pitti, but this gives you a really good idea of what Fra Bartolomeo had to offer. And then on the right, Michelangelo's Holy Family, the Doni Tondo, 1505, uh, now in the Uffizi. So Raphael gets to Florence and comes into contact with these guys. So you know, Florence is where the Renaissance was kind of born. The idea of uh, plotting one point perspective actually happened in Florence. So Raphael gets to Florence and he meets these artists and sees works of art by these artists. And he really assimilated certain ideas that he came into contact with here in Florence. Things like atmospheric perspective. Look at the backgrounds of the Leonardo and Michelangelo paintings. Um, kind of that recession into space and kind of things turned hazy and blue. Um, Leonardo studied that very specifically in his notebooks. Um, so this was kind of something that these guys studied and worked on. Um, also the use of sfumatura, this kind of haziness, this way of contouring figures without a, a really hard line. Michelangelo does not do that. Michelangelo uses a very kind of sculptural line to outline his figures. The contours of the figures in the other two artists, Fra Bartolomeo and Leonardo, are much more kind of hazy and kind of fuzzy. They also use that to create atmosphere. You can really feel the humidity in these paintings. They're also using light to help model the figures. They're using light and shade together. These guys are all using very volumetric, monumental figures, and they're kind of injecting drama into their panels by um, giving each figure sort of an interesting um, pose basically to the figures and then also the complexity of the figural groups themselves. So these, these are things that all had an impact on the young Raphael and just after a couple of years of exposure to this kind of stuff, um, Raphael produced this and this is called the Alba Madonna. It's dated 1510. It's in the collection of the National Gallery of Art. It's about three feet in diameter. So you can kind of see here, Raphael starts to kind of solidify his mature style, and he's really embodying high Renaissance ideals. There's a clarity of form and composition. Notice that the figures are really within a very solid triangle inside of the tondo, the circle. So you've got a perfect triangle inside of a perfect circle, creating this very solid composition. The figures themselves are lifelike. There's a harmonious use of colors. The space is quite plausible and there's just, you know, great recession into space with the atmospheric um, perspective in the distance. And Raphael here to me really hits kind of a sweet spot with the monumentality of the figures and where he places them in the picture plane. They're very up close to the picture plane so they feel close to us. They're not going overboard and poking out of the picture plane like some kind of 3D movie when you have those glasses on. Um, that comes later and that can kind of get kitschy in a way. So Raphael's kind of hit that sweet spot and he really kind of with the monumentality of the figures and where he places them in the picture plane provides this sense of grandeur mixed with a little bit of humility as well. He's placed the Madonna, the mother of Christ, sitting directly on the ground. Um, and he's also given gravitas to this um, holy family. It's the mother, um, the mother of Christ, Madonna, Christ, and the young Saint John. And what's going on here, if you look at it, Christ, the baby Christ, is um, taking the, cruc the cross from baby Saint John. And there's kind of a reckoning going on here. Um, Christ and Mary already know what's going to happen, and St. John seems to have just figured out what's going to happen here. So as, tri as Christ takes the cross, it's this recognition of basically how this story is going to play out. And so look at the interplay of their glances. That is where, to me, the gravitas comes in here. St. John looks at Mary as if to say, can this possibly be true? And both Christ and Mary look back at St. John and they're like, yeah, you, you know, get used to it. We, we, we already know what's going to happen and we have to kind of accept what's going on here. Um, another um, 
characteristic of Raphael's mature style is called, uh, in Italian they say sprezzatura, and this is a term that was actually invented by a friend of Raphael, a courtier um, called uh, Baldassare Castiglione, he was at court at Urbino. He invented this phrase um, sprezzatura as to kind of refer to almost this kind of ease and naturalness and effortlet, effortlessness of the construction of this painting. And it kind of belies all the work that went into it. So sprezzatura is something that seems to come very easily to Raphael. So you have this very solid kind of calming composition with um, the grandeur and the gravitas of um, the subject matter as he interpreted it. So it's paintings like this that lead art historians to describe Raphael as the very best of the very best painters. And it's what makes us consider um, Raphael in the trinity of high Renaissance masters together with Leonardo and Michelangelo. So works like this really gained uh, fame for Raphael and he was called to Rome in 1508 by the Pope. And when the Pope calls you to Rome, you go to Rome. So 1508, uh, the Pope is um, Julius II. He was Giuliano della Rovere, and you're seeing him here pictured when he was a cardinal. And in the um, painting on the right, you can see um, Giuliano della Rovere with his cousin, together with their uncle, who was Pope Sixtus IV, Francesco della Rovere. So the Pope is Bishop of Rome. He's the head of the Catholic Church, and he's the head of the Papal States. So in this period, early 1500s, um, the papacy, the Papal States, was a major temporal power and a political force on the European continent. And the Della Rovere family, thanks to, um, you know, rife nepotism, was a very powerful political dynasty. So Giuliano Della Rovere ascends to the papacy as Pope Julius II in 1503. He's known as the warrior pope. He practiced a very aggressive foreign policy. He actually personally led his troops into battle. I'm always kind of freaked out by that. I'm like, you know, most popes are sort of supposed to be saying mass in the Vatican, right? This guy's holding a sword on a horse, leading the papal troops into battle. Um, his goal was to consolidate the power of the papal states in the entire peninsula of Italy. He wanted to kick the Spanish out of the southern part. They, at this point, um, uh, reign over Naples, Sardinia, and Sicily. He wants to kick the French out of the north. And he's really keeping his eye on Austria, who has got their sights set on the Republic of Venice. So his um, goal here is um, to assert the kind of rights, I think, of the papal state, right? And um, he's trying to make sure that they're considered on the same footing as other major, major political powers. So he's waging war. He's trying to uh, gain territory. In fact, under uh, Pope Julius II, the Papal States were kind of at their, had their widest borders. The most territory that was ever um, conquered by the Papal States was during his reign. And you can see that here in red. Um, he also undertook very, very ambitious building programs and decorative programs. So this is, uh, the Vatican and St. Peter's as we know it today. And it looks like this uh, partly because Julius II really undertook an enormous building program. So what you're looking at, of course, is the um, Square of St. Peter's defined by the colonnade of Bernini, which was not here in that. This was built 120 years later, 160 years later. You're looking at the Basilica of St. Peter. This is the second church on this site, kind of the new Basilica of St. Peter. That was actually commissioned by Julius II in the early 1500s. And you can see the Apostolic Palace, which is this group of buildings over here. Um, that also contains the Vatican Museum. So if any of y'all have been to Rome and been to the Vatican Museums, you were right over in here. Um, Julius II established the Vatican Museums. He established the Swiss Guards, and he began the building of uh, the second church of St. Peter's. This is not at all though what the Vatican looked like when he got there. When Julius arrived, um, this is what Vatican City looked like. Uh, the um, Apostolic Palace was present. You can see that here. And you're looking at the, this is the entryway to the old St. Peter's. And this is just sort of a set of walls that goes down this way. So if you're on that same place today, this is what it looks like. So if you go to a papal audience today, you're literally looking at the exact same angle from that drawing. 
And you can see today the facade of New St. Peter's, the Colonnade of Bernini, and that little bit of the Apostolic Palace. So let's go back to the drawing. This is done by um, Martin von Hinskirk in the early 1500s. And here it is, that little bit of the Apostolic Palace. So this was already present. And what was kind of renovated, torn down and rebuilt basically by Julius is the entryway here into, this is the entryway, into this courtyard, which leads you to the facade of old St. Peter's and then of course into the church and then back to the high altar, which is on top of the tomb of old St. Peter's. So Julius II decided after 1100 years, this building needed to be just basically torn down and rebuilt. He wasn't, he decided it was dilapidated. He wasn't going to uh, try and renovate. He wanted to build a new St. Peter's that would be the greatest building on earth to glorify St. Peter, to glorify the Papal States and to glorify the Della Rovere family. And that's basically what he proceeded to do. He tore down the original Church of St. Peter's. It had been built in the fourth century AD by the Roman Emperor Constantine and had been literally um, embellished for 1100 years. And unfortunately the masterpieces there, many of them were destroyed. Lots of them were reduced to bits and dispersed. So we've kind of lost that. But Julius did in fact make um, the Vatican basically into the Italian Versailles. So you have to think of it that way. This is a royal palace marking the seat of power of a major political power. This is basically what it looks like today. So when Julius uh, got to Rome and then when he called Raphael down to Rome, this was not here. This is a uh, construction site. And the head architect at the time was um, Donato Bramante, who actually was from Urbino and was a friend of Raphael. And then these buildings, in fact, were here. So this, again, is the Apostolic Palace. So think about this. Um, the Apostolic Palace is literally like the Versailles of, um, of Italy. Here's a close-up view of the Apostolic Palace here, um, that part of it. So it's full of courtyards, fancy reception halls, really, really, really ornate reception halls to receive foreign dignitaries, lots of chapels, lots of private space. There's a library, um, a little museum gets started in here, which turns into a huge museum. So um, there are great decorative programs going on here as well. In fact, here is the Sistine Chapel. It's upside down, Capella Sistina. This was known as the uh, Capella Magna, the big chapel. The original decoration um, what that we know today was begun by uh, Sixtus IV, that's the uncle of um, Julius II, so the Della Rovere Pope from the 1480s. He actually began the decoration in this chapel and he called in the greatest artists of the day to do panels uh, right here along this register of the chapel. Julius II called in Michelangelo. He, um, of course, was asked to do the ceiling in the early 1500s. 30 years later, he was asked to do the um, uh, wall behind the altar here with the Last Judgment. And then Raphael also was asked to contribute here, and we're not going to go into detail on this because uh, there's just like so much, and we're going to kind of concentrate on um, another aspect here of the um, Apostolic Palace. But you can see here the um, tapestries of Raphael. He was asked to design a series of tapestries depicting the lives of St. Peter and Paul. Um, he drew these life-size cartoons that were then sent to Brussels where they were woven into tapestries. And what you're looking at here is um, the rehanging of these tapestries. They're dispersed throughout the world in different museums and different collections. Last year, they were brought to Rome for a week. Um, last year was the 500th anniversary of the death of Raphael. And there were exhibitions all throughout town. That was actually my first outing after um, lockdown was to go see the Raphael show of the Quirinale. And for that event, they reinstalled um, on-site Raphael's tapestries. So that's kind of a view of the Sistine Chapel, which is here. So when Raphael is called in 1508 to come down and work uh, in the Apostolic Palace, uh, Michelangelo was there working on the Sistine ceiling. Raphael was asked to um, do the decoration in this loggia, and he was asked to decorate this room right here. He did such a good job. This is the Sala de la uh, the Stanza de la Segnatura. He did such a good job that the artists who had contracts on these other rooms, basically their contracts were taken away and Raphael was given the contracts to do all of these. So let's take a look at what are now called the Stanze or rooms of Raffaello. These were to be um, 
private rooms for the Pope. Sometimes people think maybe it was going to be a library. There are people who think maybe it wasn't going to be a library, but in any event, these are rooms for the private use of the Pope. So this is the Stanza della Segnatura, and this is the first of those rooms that Raphael painted. And there's a very elaborate decorative program. Um, Lorenzo, to stay online. Allora, mi puoi mettere nello chat per favore il sito del Vaticano? www.museivaticano.va So this, these rooms, the decorative program is really, really elaborate and it starts from the ceiling and you cannot get the whole thing in one picture. And so um, I just asked Lorenzo to please put the um, website of the Vatican Museums up on the chat. If you go to the Vatican Museum website, you can actually see a virtual tour of these rooms. You can go all the way around and see all four walls and you can go up and you can see the ceiling and you can come back down. So you get a really good idea of what's happening here with um, the decorative program. So this is, again, the Sansta della Segnatura. And remember, we're at this Renaissance humanist court. So the topic and execution of the works of art in here would have been discussed with not just the patron who was the Pope and the artist who was Raphael, but also the poets and philosophers who were at court. And the theme of this room is to celebrate the divine gift of knowledge. And so up in the ceiling, you can see here, there are four rondels. And they are allegories of law, theology, poetry, and philosophy. These are the channels through which divine knowledge is made available to us. So we're just going to take a look at uh, philosophy. And you can see her, she's seated on kind of an Egyptian throne. And the putti behind her have two tablets. And they say, Calzarum cognitio, understanding the cause and nature of all things. So that's the idea of philosophy. And the large painting in this kind of big lunette space right underneath the rondel of philosophy kind of elaborates on the theme. And that is what uh, Raphael did with the painting known as the School of Athens. That is not the name that Raphael gave to this painting. Um, he did this between 1509 and 1511. And it's a fresco, so it's a uh, pigment that's been uh, literally painted onto wet plaster, so it kind of becomes the wall. And you are, in fact, looking at... Uh, Socrates and Plato surrounded by, you know, their students and hence the School of Athens. So the space um, is a fictive space that definitely kind of harks back to the ancient world. Uh, right in this period in 1510, Raphael was made prefect of antiquities of Rome. So he was in charge of cataloging and also um, in charge of preservation activities for uh, Roman ruins during this point. So he created this very um, again, kind of, it's a fictive space, but it definitely takes you back to the ancient, ancient world. And he's populated it with 58 thinkers and philosophers and practitioners of the liberal arts and sciences. So again, the idea is that knowledge has a divine origin and it gives us the capacity for study and understanding so that, and that kind of creates human knowledge. That's how we gain knowledge. So let's take a look here at who um, Raphael decided to depict in this, uh, in this space. Here are Plato and uh, Aristotle holding books, their own writings. They're kind of walking forward and they are um, surrounded by their um, students who are kind of hanging on their every word. And then outside of that group, people are kind of doing their own thing like these guys. So notice how overall how they're depicted. He used very strong uh, vanishing a single point perspective with the vanishing point right here. So he would have learned this from his father and from Perugino, and he decided to kind of go with this very clear um, one point perspective with the vanishing point here. If you put the vanishing point down here, you get a very dramatic kind of um, de Soto and Sue angle on figures. If you put the vanishing point over here, you almost get kind of a um, kind of unsettling type of a view. He's been going very clear and straightforward, and you're looking straight at those figures like this, um, straight on. Notice also how the architecture recedes back into space. So he's creating this depth of space. And notice how the figures recess into space as well. So you see Plato and Aristotle, they're much smaller than the figures you see up here in the foreground because, of course, they're farther away from us, and our eye, of course, um, sees them as... Um, smaller as they recess into space. Right, let's look at this group of figures here in the right foreground. You can see Euclid who's bending over teaching geometry to a group of students. 
Um, that's actually the model for the figure here. The model uh, for Euclid was actually Donato Bramante, who is um, the head architect of the Vatican Works and Raphael's friend. Um, so here he is surrounded by four different students who are kind of in different um, phases of learning and understanding. Um, you can see Ptolemy with the celestial globe. And on the right, you can see two figures who are Greek painters. And in the black cap, that's actually the um, self-portrait of Raphael. And on uh, in the white cap, we're not sure who that is. This guy's got gray hair. It's an older painter. It may be Perugino. may perhaps be his father. We're not actually sure who that is. And then the group in the left foreground is here. And this is Pythagoras. And he's kind of scribbling away in his notebooks. Um, is um, kind of elaborating on his numerical and musical theory. And he's surrounded by this kind of cross-cultural entourage. You see the guy in the back there with the green robe on and the turban and that kind of interesting mustache. So Pythagoras is actually known for teaching around the known world and kind of picking up these groupies from everywhere he went. And so he had these, this group of followers that was you know, sort of exotic looking. And then notice that solitary figure over there on the right. He doesn't really fit in with this group. This group is kind of a closed group. You can see that. They're all kind of um, Pythagoras is ignoring them as he works, but they're all kind of concentrating on what, what Pythagoras is doing. The guy to the right here, um, he's really doing his own thing. This is Heraclitus. He is a Greek philosopher who expounded on the theory called panta re. Everything is always flowing. Everything is always in flux. Nothing is permanent except for change. That used to make me, like, give me heart palpitations. But the more I think about it, the more I find it kind of calming. So um, it's an interesting theory. And if you notice how this guy is depicted, A, he's by himself, he's kind of brooding. Um, he's also not wearing a toga and nor is he barefoot. Everybody else in this picture seems to be um, in a toga and either barefooted or wearing fancy Roman sandals. And he's wearing a tunic and these leather boots, which looks like more contemporary clothing. And as it turns out, um, this figure was actually added after the uh, School of Athens was completed. So after Raphael completed the School of Athens. You can see what it would have looked like. Um, the drawing on the top is a life-size cartoon, and it's quite uh, very much a finished drawing. This is exactly what that painting is supposed to look like. So you can see when it was done, there was no Heraclitus um, thinking about Pantere and uh, flux and change. This figure was added later. So the story is that uh, Michelangelo, and these in fact are the features of Michelangelo here on the face of Heraclitus, the um, Greek uh, philosopher. The story is that um, Michelangelo saw Raphael as a rival and uh, refused to let him or anyone else in to see the progress of the Sistine ceiling. Um, Raphael, I don't think really necessarily even felt like he had rivals. I don't, he doesn't seem to have had kind of just, that wasn't something he entertained. I think he was too busy. You know, he had a very active social life and a lot of girlfriends. I don't think he was really worried about other artists. That just that wasn't really in his sphere. Um, but Michelangelo definitely felt kind of a rivalry with uh, Raphael and treated him quite poorly in public. And we have documents of that. So we know that that happened. Um, in any event, the story goes that it was impossible to get in to see what, Mike, what Michelangelo was working on when he was working on the Sistine ceiling. He wouldn't let anybody in. And of course, he locked the door when he left. But Bramante, Raphael's friend, who is the architect in charge of the Vatican works, you know, he had a key. So they went in to take a look. They snuck in and just wanted to see what was going on on the Sistine ceiling. So here's the Sistine ceiling complete. I'm not sure when it was that they would have uh, made their way sort of sneaking into the Sistine uh, Chapel. They would have seen um, the, the work, you know, sort of as it progressed towards completion. But they definitely got a look at what Michelangelo was working on. And um, we understand that Raphael was extremely impressed with, in particular, the figures of the Sibyls, which are in these niches right here. You can see them here, and with the figures called the Ignudi, these nude figures, which are kind of perched on top of these pedestals. So I'm going to show y'all two um, uh, details, the Libyan Sibyl, and then this guy, the Ignudi, who happens to be kind of relaxing back on a pile of acorns, and acorns happen to be the symbol of the Della Rovere family. So here they are, these two incredible uh, monumental figures. So Raphael was so impressed by the monumentality 
of these figures that he went back to the School of Athens, which was a perfect painting. And in fact, his is still his most famous work. And he added in a figure here. And it's kind of an homage to Michelangelo. That's why I really don't think that he felt this rivalry so much. Um, he, as an homage to Michelangelo, he included um, a new figure with the features of Michelangelo, monumental figure kind of, you know, hanging out down here, brooding over Pantere, um, in contemporary clothing even. Um, I think that's quite extraordinary. Um, so that's kind of how I see how Raphael sees the relationship between these artists. I think he really appreciated um, the novelty and the, um, you know, just the, you know, clear create creativity of Michelangelo. So. Um, again, looking at this painting as a whole, we can see that Raphael really conforms to um, Alberti's principles on creating a painting. So Leon Battista Alberti wrote treatises on architecture and also painting kind of a generation before, but he codified what became the high Renaissance principles for creating a work of art. Balanced composition, no distractions, a plausible space, good relationships of the whole, decorous figures who are moving with graceful mo movements and the figures are shown realistically for their age and station. So I don't know whether or not Raphael actually read Alberti or if he just came naturally to this. I think you know the sprezzatura and kind of beauty and harmony and balance of Raphael may have just sort of fit into these Albertian principles, but Michelangelo actually did not fit into these Albertian principles. And I have a feeling that Michelangelo didn't really care about that. He, was, he wasn't worried about it. He wasn't trying for that. He was doing his own thing, but he was in fact criticized for it by um, early art historians, later art historians, and his contemporary painters. So um, the idea is that, for example, here, what you can really see is that uh, Michelangelo tends to give everybody this body, you know, bodybuilder muscles, no matter who they are, how old they are, what sex they are. So, the, you know, the kind of hot dude on the left, um, being Nudo, he, of course, kind of merits all of his muscles. Whereas, look at the figures on the right. There's this woman who has definitely been to the gym a lot, on the lap machine, maybe. And there's this little puto who's got some biceps. And even these little dudes, little, little putti back here in relief are kind of, you know, they're very buff. So the idea of this kind of overly accentuated musculature wasn't necessarily um, found pleasing to everybody who looked at these paintings. I think Michelangelo's great. I don't really have a problem with it, but um, some people did. He did, in fact, get criticized for it, even by Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo said that Michelangelo's figures look like sacks of walnuts. So imagine a burlap sack full of walnuts and all those little bumps in there. And that's kind of what this woman's back looks like. So the idea for the people who are going more for harmony, beauty, those high Renaissance ideals like Alberti would be, yes, know your um, anatomy, know the bones and the muscles, but feel free to put some flesh over them as well. And that is, that's basically what Raphael did. So he sort of considered um, Il Divine Pittore, the divine painter, um, because of the harmony and balance that he gave to his compositions. So let's look briefly at another one of those four rooms. This is the, um, Stanza di Eliodoro, the, the room of Heliodorus. And again, if you go onto the Vatican website, you can actually see the full program here. We're just going to look at the one uh, painting, which is, is the expulsion of Heliodorus from the temple. This entire room, the decoration here is more linked to current events um, than the previous room. And here we're looking at a, a scene from the Old Testament from Maccabees and Heliodorus, who has been trying to steal the treasure out of the temple in Jerusalem. Um, you see him here kind of trampled on the ground. Um, he and his men came in to try and steal the treasure out of the temple. And the high priest, who you see right there in the very uh, center of the composition, prayed to God to send down angels to expel him from the temple. And that's in fact what happened. And then on the left of the painting, you can see, so just kind of zoom in, here we get left and right. So here's these angels who are kind of floating in. You can see their shadows over here. And um, they are... Um, taking care of Heliodorus and his men who are trying to make their way off with the treasure. And then on the left, there's a group of characters who are either kind of um, enthralled by what's going on or just um, scared of it. And then farther left still is this group of contemporary characters. This, these guys are, in fact, um, uh, 
personages from the 1500s. And you can see Pope Julius II being born on a litter, looking very regal. He's wearing his um, red coat, which is lined with ermine. He's also wearing a beard, which is kind of particular. Um, and it's very particular. It was written about a lot and that helps us date these paintings. Uh, any painting with him with a beard is very kind of particular. Um, he led the papal troops into battle at Bologna and they ended up losing the city. They lost the city of Bologna. And out of mourning for having lost the city of Bologna for the Papal States, he decided to grow a beard. So that's when you see him bearded. 1511, 12 is when Pope Julius grew this big white beard. Um, during that um, um, battle, they were basically trying to expel the French from Italy. And that's kind of the analogy here with expelling Heliodorus from the tomb. They're making um, a connection to Julius trying to expel the French from Italy. So that's kind of the um, connection to current events here in this particular panel. Um, interestingly, Julius had a portrait of himself painted by Raphael. And at the same time period, you can tell because of the beard, um, you can see Raphael's original silver point drawing. He seems to have drawn this from life. And he may have used that same drawing for the portrait you see here and the portrait you see here. But that's kind of where the similarities end. So here is Julius II being portrayed quite regally. He is being shown from below. He's being, uh, you know, literally carted around on a litter. Here, things are quite different. He's got the trappings um, of his position. He's wearing the ermine-lined cope and cap. He's sitting on a throne. There are gold finials, which are actually the acorns of the Del Rovere family, but he looks very frail kind of fragile, and that is the viewpoint here. We're looking down on the Pope. This is really weird that the Pope would have even permitted himself to be shown in this way. So what's going on here? What we think is happening is that the Pope asked for this. He requested Raphael to do this on purpose. Um, this painting was not to be displayed to the public. It was done as an ex voto. Um, he's asking for mercy from the Madonna. During that battle in uh, Bologna, the Pope was stricken ill. He knew he was not going to recover and he was at the end of his life and he decided to request this um, uh, portrait as an ex voto to the Madonna and it was offered to the Madonna um, on the high altar of Santa Maria del Popolo, which was in fact Giuliano de la Rovere's titular church before he was made Pope. So he really looks Again, fragile, almost penitent, and almost submissive in a certain sense because of the viewpoints. It's a very, very powerful um, kind of telling portrait of um, the great warrior pope. So Julius II died in 1513, but before he passed away, he did, in fact, commission one more painting from Raphael, and that is the Sistine Madonna. So again, notice the adjective Sistine that comes from Sixtus, the Pope Sixtus, who again is an uncle of um, uh, Giuliano della Rovere, the Pope that was Francesco della Rovere. So the idea of this painting was to be placed in a church and dedicated um, to Uncle Sixtus. This was done in 1513. Again, it's the very last painting that Julius II commissioned from Raphael. This is an enormous painting. It's nine and a half feet by eight and a half feet. It is in Dresden today. Um, it's again, this super clear, very harmonious, high Renaissance composition that uh, Raphael was so good at. Um, what we're looking at is um, Sixtus, um, Saint Sixtus, in this case, is kind of gesturing for us to come in, and he is kind of, you know, humble below the uh, Madonna and Child. The face is actually that of Julius II. Saint Barbara, who was requested by Julius II, has opened these lovely heavy green curtains for us so that we can have this kind of private, intimate view of um, the Madonna and Child. Notice there's sort of, hum kind of humble details here. Um, the Madonna's... Um, kind of head drape is, you know, quite humble. It's not sort of fancy brocade by any means. Look at the um, the curtain rod, how thin it is and how it kind of bows down in the middle. Those little angels underneath, of course, are probably the most overly reproduced detail of any work of art in the history of art. Um, and they're serving a purpose. Of course, they're adorable and you look at them, but they say, don't look at us, look up. You're supposed to be looking up here. And in case you kind of missed it, there's, there's more framing here. There's this great solid triangle, but there's also, if you just follow the robes here and the swish of Mary's robe, there's this great kind of a circle, which really kind of 
zeroes in on um, the lovely Madonna and Child. The model for the Madonna uh, was Raphael's girlfriend at the time. She was kind of his uh, long-term girlfriend, La Fornarina. So this kind of simple, touching, kind of almost perfect painting really kind of accounts for Raphael's popular appeal. I mean, it's relatively sentimental, but it really gained him widespread popularity. And again, this is kind of, this is why he's known as Il Divine Pittore, the divine painter. So Julius II died. Um, he was followed by um, Leo X, a Medici Pope uh, from Florence, from the Medici family, actually a friend of Raphael. And he kind of luckily for Raphael descended to, uh, decided to continue Julius II's decorative program. So the, uh, the painting of the rooms proceeded. Um, uh, Raphael was still working on, he was the prefect of antiquities. He's cataloging antiquities. Um, he's you know, working to preserve the Roman monuments that were found. Bramante had died and Raphael actually was appointed head architect of the Vatican works. He had tons of commissions all throughout the city as painter and also architect. And he had his very active social life. Like I mentioned, he kind of had a reputation for that. And he very unexpectedly at age 37 in 1520 died. He had a, a, an illness that lasted two weeks and he died again, age 37, quite young, very unexpectedly. So one of the things that he left sort of in progress or unfinished in any event was the Stanza di Costantino. That's the fourth room of the Stanze um, there in the Apostolic Palace. And for 500 years, we've thought that after the death of Raphael, his workshop, he had a large workshop, probably 50 different very good painters led by Giulio Romano, who made a name for himself as a Baroque artist later. So for 500 years, we thought Giulio Romano kind of gathered the troops together, um, gathered together the workshop, and they frescoed the Salone di Costantino, and that was that. Um, to Raphael's designs, um, but we figured it was done by um, Giulio Romano in the workshop. This, um, this room was um, uh, went, underwent a restoration, just kind of a cleaning and you know, consolidation of the paintings. It took them five years from uh, 2015 to 2020. And in October of last year, it was announced that actually this isn't what we thought it was. Um, they found while they were cleaning um, and you know, getting a very close up look at all of uh, all of this kind of very uh, elaborate uh, decoration here, that two of the figures were painted in oils. They weren't painted in fresco. That's weird. Um, first of all, oil on the wall is kind of an odd thing. And if you're going to do it, you're going to do it. But most people don't. They go for fresco. It's easier. But the idea of fresco and oil is bizarre. So they found two figures that actually are painted in oil. One of them is the allegory of um, amicizia or friendship. You can see what she looks like uh, before cleaning, after cleaning. And the other one is the allegory of justice. Again, here she is before cleaning and after cleaning. So it turns out we have documentary evidence that Raphael began this room before his death and he decided to do it in oil. And if you're going to put oil on the wall, you have to plaster the wall in a certain way. You have to really kind of scrub it down until it's perfectly fine, smooth surface and then treat it with kind of a resin underpainting so that your oils will actually stick to the wall. So it was kind of a big deal. And most people did not do this. And so it actually was written down. Somebody wrote this down that Raphael had done this because it was kind of an odd thing. So it seems that what happened is um, upon his death, which was totally unexpected, his um, workshop led by Giulio Romano had to finish this room. And they thought, we are not going to do this risky oil thing. We don't want to do that. We're going to finish this. We're going to use Raphael's designs, but we're going to proceed in fresco because we know we can do it well. And so we are going to chip off all of this prepared plaster and we're going to lay down fresh, wet plaster and we're going to put our pigment down as fresco, which is what they had been trained to do and what they knew how to do. But it turns out that they actually saved these two allegories that were painted by the hand of Raphael. And they have just been reattributed to Raphael as of October last year, right in the middle of COVID. So no one's really seen them. So as soon as we're out of here and we don't have to lock down anymore, let's just all go to the Vatican and check out these newly attributed figures, um, the gorgeous allegories of justice and friendship. And when we're in Rome, especially if it's winter, we're going to eat artichokes. So we're actually going to cook artichokes tonight and we're going to make a couple of Roman recipes. There are literally, there's an endless supply of artichoke recipes, but we're going to make some Roman ones um, and a couple of others. Uh, so first of all, artichokes, as you can see here, are basically cultivated versions of a wild thistle plant. And the part that we eat of the artichoke is the bud of a flower. And it's kind of this prehistoric looking kind of purple flower. So you can see this is the part, of course, that we eat, right? The bud. There are um, 
here in Italy anyway, literally dozens and dozens of varieties, dozens. And they're kind of, you know, they're a winter vegetable. We only see them in winter. We don't ever find them anytime else. You can actually still find some of the, um, mostly in the South, you can find some of these wild artichokes that are really spiky looking. Otherwise you get more varieties that look like this. And they're kind of divided into um, this type with the petals have these uh, thorns on them. And we're gonna use these tonight, Morelli. And then this other type called mame in this case, but a globe artichoke where they don't really have uh, thorns on the petals. Those are kind of the two main families. So tonight we're gonna use morelli and mame. And we are gonna make recipes, artichoke recipes typical to Rome, one of which is the carciofi alla Judea. And this is a recipe that um, is from the Jewish tradition. And um, there's a kind of big tradition of Jewish cooking in Italy and particularly in Rome, there was um, a, the, the Jews were present in Rome from the ancient period. The Jewish ghetto was established in the mid 1500s, right around the area called Portico d'Ottavia, which is what you see there on the right. Today, it's this you know great area full of really cool Jewish bakeries using cool spices and you know fun outside trattorie and then you know cool Roman ruins and great food. Um, and I was reminded just the other day, day before yesterday was the Shoah Remembrance Day. And I was reminded of the Pietre di Inciampo. So the Shoah Remembrance Day is, you know, remember to not forget. So we're going to not forget. We're going to eat carciofi alla Judea. And when we're in Rome, we are going to pay attention to the Pietre di Inciampo. That means stones that you trip on. Inciampare means trip. So the stones that you trip on in Rome are these bronze kind of golden colored cobblestones that are inserted in front of the door of the homes of people who were deported and taken to concentration camps and they contain all of the information about these folks their names their birth dates when they were deported and what happened to them and so when you're walking around rome remember to not forget so we're going to not forget with artichokes though tonight. And I think that's actually a good way also to remember. And we are gonna make carciofi alla Judea, the Jewish artichokes, which is an entire whole fried artichoke, which turns into this very pretty flower. We're also gonna make carciofi alla Romana, these. And I have a fire going, so we're gonna go ahead and stick some artichokes in the coals and make carciofi arrostiti. This is more of a Southern thing, but that's okay. We're also gonna make carciofi trifolati, which this is kind of a starting point. This is a side dish on its own, but it's also a starting point for lots of other recipes. Risotto, um, I don't know, an omelet, pasta, whatever. So I'm gonna show you how to do that because from there you can kind of go on. And we're also gonna make cachoe pepe upon request. So. Um, last time we were together, we made the trinity of pasta alla grisha, amatriciana, and carbonara. And we're going to have today, we're going to make kind of the father of all pastas, which is cacio e pepe. And y'all asked for it. So um, Lorenzo and I are going to make it for you. So let's go ahead and move into the kitchen. And Lorenzo is going to come in here and join me. Eccoli. Hey. Ma tu puoi controllare da qua, giusto? Perché vedo che tante persone sì. entrano ancora. Sì. All right, so we're going to start with, here are the, these are the two artichokes that we're going to use. We're going to use um, the morelli, which have the you know thorns on the petals, and we're going to use the globe artichoke, which these are the version, this is a version of globe artichoke called mamole. So I'm going to show you this one first. Okay. So I'm going to show you all basically how to clean an artichoke. So no matter what, um, version of artichoke you get. I'm just going to kind of show you how to clean it. And the way I do this to make less of a mess is I'm going to clean it directly into this little garbage, this um, nice grocery sack here. But you really, um, the goal is to take off all of the hard, uh, tough bits. So I also, by the way, I get artichokes that have the leg on them, the gambo, the stem. And we're going to save that because it's really uh, good to eat the center part that you can see here. But I'm going to go ahead and just kind of cut it off right here. Um, and you think these things are actually, for how prehistoric looking they are, they're actually quite tender. So in order to kind of clean the outer tough bit off, it actually strips off. Look at that. It just strips away. Done. So you're going for that clean, white, tender bit on the interior. And so I'm just going to strip that away. And then these things oxidize really, really quickly. And so I'm going to put it all in lemon water, which I have prepared. 
Just some water with a lemon squished in it. Um, gracias. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to now take away the outer leaves. These are things, not all, no matter how long you cook it, they're not going to get tender ever. And so I just get rid of them. And I'm going to take this down. You can kind of see the color changing. It starts to get light green. I'm going to take this down until it's nice and light green. Just get rid of the outer tough leaves. Watching, I'm um, trying not to poke myself because the thorns are pretty sticky. These are super tender. I can just feel it. So I'm taking them down that far. Nice and light green. Now I'm going to use, this is the opportunity to use that sheep's hoof knife that came in your knife set that you probably never used. Now's the moment. Um, just want to pare away the very outer tough bit here. This is actually the heart of the artichoke, so you really don't want to remove any more than absolutely necessary. So just get rid of all of the um, tough bits. I hope y'all can see that okay. So I'm just going to pare that down. Let's see. I'm going to dip it in the lemon water if I don't want to turn brown. I don't really care if it turns brown, but if you don't want to turn brown, you dip it in lemon water. And now I'm going to cut the point off because this is just thorns. Oops. And then the way that I um, kind of make sure that I'm down to where it's tender is I just take a bite of this. And if it's tender and I can chew it up, then it's good. And it's not. So I'm going to take off another layer of leaves. And these are super tender. We eat these raw and either carpaccio, sliced really thin, or as pensimonio. I'm going to show you how. We just cut this in half. Now you can see every artichoke is different. In the globe artichokes you get in the United States, most of them have some choke right here. And the little purple leaves right here, if they're shiny and purple, they're never going to cook. You have to cut them out. And the way to do that is to cut the artichoke into quarters. And then, using your paring knife, remove the choke, remove the kind of shiny purple leaves here. Just clip them out. And then you get your knife, just kind of I'm trying to get this way, y'all can see it. Just kind of come in under here and just take away the furry bit. And you don't want to take away um, too much, though, because this, of course, is the actual heart of the artichoke. These artichokes have very, very, very little to no choke. And in fact, I don't really have to take it out. Um, the artichokes you get in the United States actually usually do have a good bit of choke. So if you're going to eat it raw in pensimonio, you would just serve it like this a quarter. And if you're going to proceed and make, for example, carchofi trifolaki, which is what I showed you there on that slide, you would cut it into eighths, just two sort of thin slices. Um, and you would do this also if you're going to make risotto or if you're going to make pasta or an omelet or whatever. And that's what you would do. And so I have actually turned these into trifolaki. Li faccio vedere. No, fai le mamme. Okay. And I'll show you that when we plate everything. Ancora no. Okay, so we are also going to use uh, the same type of artichoke, the Morello artichoke, which is um, the kind of more oblong one with the um, uh, thorns on it. We're going to use that to cook in the coals. And Lorenzo's gotten the coals going good. And I, this needs very little work. We're actually going to stick it down directly into the coals. And so the outer tough leaves are going to kind of protect it a little bit. So they're going to get all charred and we'll take those away before we eat them. So I'm just going to cut off the top and cut off some of the gumbo. People clean. Two. And I'm not going to clean anything. You'll clean it when you're at the table. And this is kind of a fun recipe that... You know, you make it a barbecue, or if you, you know your family's gone out to the country for you know your country house kind of thing, and you build a big bonfire. People always are sticking their artichokes down in the, um, down in the coals. I'm gonna you. open it up a teeny bit. Cut you. The boy. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. Here we go. This is Lorenzo's method. He's using pressure just to kind of open those leaves up a little bit, and basically we're getting into the very center. And there's a little bit of spiky stuff. Voy toyere, si. And so the teeny bit of spiky stuff, which is the those spiky leaves and some of the, um, we're going to use, you can use the melon baller. I couldn't find my melon baller, so I'm using some teaspoons. You just kind of scoop that out. 
a scoop out that's quite heated and choke if there is any. And then we're gonna stuff this, or just basically flavor it. Um, this is not a stuffed artichoke. So we're gonna put some flavor right into the center. We're not gonna shove it down in between the leaves because it's not important. Um, as it cooks in the coals, all of the flavor we put in here is gonna kind of just kind of, you know, spread out. So I'm gonna stick in a little um, knot of sausage. This is Lorenzo's deal. Yeah. I actually prefer them I without prefer. the sausage. But we'll go ahead and stick some sausage in. And then I'm gonna put in a mix of, um, actually I'm gonna put the garlic in first. Where's my garlic? I'm gonna put in just a piece of a garlic curd. You don't have to chop the garlic up. You can just put in a kind of a spike of garlic like this. Stick it down into the sausage and it's in the time it takes to cook it's going to totally flavor and then I'm putting in a mixture of mint and parsley. Mettiamo un po' di olio no sal e pepe. So I'm going to put in some salt and I'm going to actually put that all over and then pepper and we'll put over any pepe. Okay, di qua, metto lo over mezzo. Let me get some pepper. Um e qua Oh, excuse me. I can't find my pepper. So, so Lorenzo's got some already prepared ones, and he's going to stick them down into the coal. So show us how we're going to cook these. Yeah. Okay. I'm going. Okay. I'm going to get out of the way so y'all can see Lorenzo. So he's just going to shove them kind of leg down. Is the sausage, Elaine, is the sausage cooked or raw? Raw. Raw. Sausage is raw. It's going to cook okay. in the coal. I left the leg too long. I want this to stand up. There we go. I started this fire about four hours ago to make sure I had enough coals that we could do this. So this is the kind of thing. So I'm really cooking here in my fireplace. This is where the people who lived in this house cooked. And I'm just using, you know, wood. Olive wood, um, oak wood. Okay. And so the because the food has gone directly down into the coals, it's probably better to just use real wood and not charcoal because I think it would just get that charcoaly flavor as opposed to just smoky. Can you put that in? Can you put that in a barbecue, a gas barbecue? I don't think it's going to work in a gas barbecue. You actually need to in, immerse it into the coals. But the good thing about artichokes is there are about a thousand recipes, and so you can just make another artichoke recipe if you don't have any coals to immerse them into. They kind of have to go. They have to sit down in the coal. Elaine, can you move the computer so we could get a close up of what he's done there? I'm going to take y'all over to see what Lorenzo's done over here. Echo she. Hang on, can we see? Can y'all see that? Okay, so we have our five artichokes lined up in the coals. We can see it. Oh, good. Okay, good. All right, so I'm going to proceed. Okay, so I'm going to proceed to um, the Mame artichokes, which are the globe artichoke. And I'm going to show you all how to make what uh, is carciofi alla romana, which is kind of interesting in that um, it is also made in Tuscany, they call them carciofi ricci. Um, what does that even mean? It means artichokes that stand up. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to take away some of those tough outer leaves. L'olio acceso. L'olio acceso. Okay. Take away the tough outer leaves until we get to where it turns to kind of a the lighter color. Let's see. Hmm? Okay. And then I'm going to clean. I'm not going to clean. I'm going to leave the leg on. I'm going to cut off about that much of it. So these are. Let's see. So again, I'm going to take away the outer tough bit, but I'm trying to preserve as much of the heart as I can. So I'm just going to sort of pare around the bottom, taking away as little as humanly possible. And I'm going to dip it in lemon water so it doesn't turn a funny color. Okay, so that's what this looks like. First step. Now I'm going to cut off the top end. There are it doesn't have the same thorns that the Morello does, but it's still a little spiky. So I'm gonna cut that off. And 
And then this doesn't have, so here we go, I've cut the top off. I'm gonna do some more lemon water for you. Um, and then this has to get, so what we're gonna do is just put some flavorings in it and then it's gonna cook for about 45 minutes in a pan like that with a bunch of, artichokes. we're gonna do five artichokes at a time in a pan. But the way to get the flavoring in here is to open the leaves up. And the way to open the leaves up is to pound it. So, okay. so I have to pound the artichoke. And I would normally do this on the counter, but I don't have a good counter here, so I'm just gonna do it right here. Um, so I'm gonna pound and kind of turn and pound and turn. Whoa, whoa, I just broke the leg. Okay, so the artichoke, when you do that, kind of just loosens up. It just starts to loosen. I'm gonna pound a couple more times. Here we go. Okay, so now it looks like that. So you see, just pounding it makes all of the leaves kind of open up. And I'm gonna just put some flavorings in here. I'm gonna do the same thing as um, the little spike of just a little spike of garlic. And I'm gonna put in some mint, which is here. And all these flavors, this takes 45 minutes to cook. So while it's sort of cooking in um, kind of um, just water and olive oil, these flavors kind of permeate. So I've just stuck in um, some mint. I'm gonna put some salt. I'm actually gonna go ahead and try to get some salt everywhere. And then just a little bit of pepper. And then these guys, Again, you would have more of them. Si, por favor. Si. So I'm going to show you what they look like when they're done. Lorenzo's going to show you what they look like. They kind of steam. You put, a, you put a cloth covering over. You put them face down in the pan. You add water and oil. And then you kind of put a cloth on there. And then there they are. I show you. Hang on. I'm going to go like this. So that's what they look like when they're done. And we're gonna we'll plate all this up for you in a in a, in a bit. Okay, so that's one mamo de. All right, so faccio ora la edizione di Maria. 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 Okay. 110. So we're gonna do now the carciofi alla Judea, which is kind of a feat of um, carving. So the, the the goal is to make a little rose out of this. So I'm going to take off the really super, super rough outer leaves. So I'm going to start the way we did for the other one. I'm going to take away the rough outer leaves. See? Just get that kind of double frying, uh, like I know some of y'all do with your french fries. The first frying is a little bit of a lower temperature, and the second frying is at a much higher temperature. So Lorenzo's... Uh, Okay, it has to be 130, 150. Okay, the prima frittura. So we're going to get the oil up to 130 degrees centigrade, and I'll tell y'all what that is in Fahrenheit when I send it to you tomorrow. So I've taken away the outer leaves. I'm going to clean up a little bit the um, base. Preserving as much as I can, of course, with the heart. The heart is not just heart. No. I'm going to clean off the gambo stalk. So the goal here is to kind of carve this into what can kind of bloom as a flower, basically. I'm gonna run this through some of my lemon water just so it doesn't turn a funny color. Okay, and now I'm gonna start, um, I'm gonna start with my little paring knife, just kind of removing some of the leaves and they're gonna be shorter on the outside and taller on the inside. So that when it's in the oil, it can open up as if it were a flower. I am up though. All right, so our oil's ready, but I'm not ready yet. So, so you can kind of, let me show you how we're, can you, can you see what I'm doing here? I've taken away, see there's a petal here, there's another petal down here. So I'm just kind of taking away layers of leaves so that when it's in the hot oil, it has a chance to open up as if it were a flower. You really want it to kind of look like a rose. I'm going to chop the top off. Okay. Just on the twist list. See, just on the twist list. Twist of all, I can do. See. All 
front tip to get beaten again. I'm gonna let Lorenzo do that because he's kind of good at the beaten part. I'm gonna do one more little petal so that it looks like a pretty rose. So see, we've, I've gotten it down so it looks like this. Now we're gonna, Lorenzo's gonna beat it on the counter so that it kind of starts to open up a little bit and then we're gonna fry it. And it gets fried for several minutes at, again, a relatively low temperature. We're gonna take it out and do a second frying to kind of crisp it up. We're gonna box it in? We're gonna box it in. Okay. So I may have a bunk of bannock, okay? A okay. couple of pounds of them. Okay. 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 I sent you a down board back to you. All right, so we're kind of just loose, we're kind of giving it a head start. It's going to open up like a flower in the oil, but we're letting it, we're kind of just loosening it up a lot. Okay. You have to go last year. Actually, I'm okay. going to go last year. Okay. Let's see. For now, I'm okay. Yeah, call it. Okay, good. All right, so that's going to, we're going to let that cook for a couple of minutes. You have to see what happens. I'll have a little bit of I'm gonna let it cook for a couple, you know, just to kind of give it some color. Face down like that, and then I'm gonna sort of turn it on the side a couple times so that the, um, the sides of the flower get cooked and the leg, uh, the gumbo, the sauce, and the heart also cook. Let's see. Let's see how good it's so far. Exactly. Let's see how good it is. Let's see. So our pasta water is also boiling. As soon as this is done, we're going to show you all pasta with pepe. Then we'll plate everything. I assume you're using olive oil to this fry that? Olive oil. Thank you for asking that. I'm using olive oil. And I'm using, um, when I do, when I fry like this, and I'm using kind of a liter of olive oil. Um, I use um, a nice clean um, organic extra virgin olive oil that I usually buy in bulk. It's not quite the same kind of um, complex aromas as bottled olive oil. Um, but when you're doing something like this, I kind of prefer olive oil and I have endless supply. Um, it's okay to use sunflower oil. Um, I understand that not everybody wants to, you know, dump a liter and a half of super good olive oil into a pan to fry an, ar an artichoke. So um, if I were not using artichoke, I think I would probably, I'm using uh, olive oil, I think I would uh, choose a, uh, an Expel Press sunflower oil. How come you didn't have to cut out the center of this artichoke like you did the others? Eat it by hand and kind of you, pick, you can kind of pick around. If there's any choke in there, you can eat around it. The way the way it's eaten is almost like you're picking um, potato chips off 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 of a plate, and so you can just skip any choke if there is any. Um, you, you don't just cut it and take a bite. You actually eat it by with your hands as if it were potato chips. And can you use the Morelli for this or no? Huh? Can you use the Morelli artichokes? No. Okay. Lorenzo said no, but no. I'm not sure why. Why no? It's very important the shape of the artichoke in this preparation. Oh, John. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't have a wide enough base. You really want that nice wide base so that it kind of opens up for you. I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna let it stand up a little bit more. Oh. I highly on the artichoke that you uh, boil, why do you have a cloth on top? It kind of helps it steam in there. So it was on a very low temperature for 45 minutes. And having the cloth on top just kind of helps keep all this steam in. Um, and it kind of, um, uh, what's the other term for that? Stufato. See? It's stufato. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. It's not braised, it's stufato. You really want the steam. That's why it's, um, the cloth is on there. Good question. All right, so I'm gonna see if this is done yet. The first 
uh, frying. I'm going to poke the basically the heart and just see if it's tender. Nice. See if you know. See, one minute. We're going to give it another minute. The petals are kind of starting to get uh, turn dark and flop out. So Lorenzo is going to make cacio e pepe for us while I'm doing fried artichokes. Questo? Eh? È già fatto. Sì, infatti, per di vedere il Oh, ok, good. Ok. Right, so Lorenzo is going to show you the cheese we're using. I'm going to grate the cheese, this pecorino romano cheese, and uh, I already grated for you. This is a very simple recipe. We only have two ingredients, is uh, pecorino romano and black pepper. It, it's enough. It is enough. You can be going cora, you can cora and cora. So you see. I like a lot of pepper in that. Especially if the only two ingredients are cheese and pepper, you have to use a lot of ingredients. Yeah, we have a different way to make cacio e pepe. One is uh, the, the um, one recipe, one to, you have to roast the pepper in a pan before, and then you have the cheese apart. So you have two preparations, the, the, the pan with the black pepper roast, and the, the water that we, with the uh, amido is a starch. starch. Yeah, and um, and after you put the, the pecorino romano, but the, the simple way is this: you have to uh, mix the pecorino romano and pepper, and uh, five uh, three minutes before the, the pasta is ready, you have to take a little bit of water, uh, and uh, you have to um, cool down the temperature of the water and add to the pecorino romano, but only very few. Um, for example. Uh, very little. Very little, same. Uno, due, three, uno, due, one or two spoonfuls. Spoon. Yeah. So the key here, I actually prefer this way. He was talking about another way where you can actually make this in a pan. Um, first of all, that means you have to clean another pan, which I'm not interested in. And second of all, the cheese here is really kind of touchy. This is a super simple recipe. There's two ingredients plus water. Um, but if you get the, if the cheese gets too hot, it will seize and kind of just make lumps basically. So you wanna be very careful to prevent that from happening. And the way to do that is to make sure that the cheese does not come in contact with heat that is more than 65 degrees centigrade. I think that's 150 Fahrenheit. Again, I'll send you that tomorrow specifically. But the easy way around that is don't put it over the flame. Use some pasta cooking water that has actually had a moment to cool or use very, very small amounts of it but you're not actually adding a ton of boiling water to the cheese. Otherwise, again, the cheese will seize. It just makes lumps and you can't recover from that. So the only trick here is to watch the, the water temperature. Yeah, and the, and the amount of water. You right. don't have, you don't need to have a very liquid preparation. You, I show you, it's very like uh, pastella, fry. No, no, um, what's the yeah. word? batter. It's like batter. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I don't know the, Eng <laughs> the English word, but if Elaine say yeah, you say yes. So he's going to work on cacio e pepe, and I'm going to work on our second frying for the artichoke. And I need the oil to be a little bit hotter. And so to make the um, artichoke crisp up nicely, we're going to just kind of sprinkle it with some cold water. Cold water. Ancora, ancora, lo stai abbassando? No, so okay, I'll mm -hmm. so let's give that a second, it needs to heat up. So we really want this to be 180 degrees centigrade, which is 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Posso andare avanti a salare, etc. So I'm gonna just kind of gently open this up a little bit. I'm gonna add some salt and pepper. We can add this. Yeah? Huh? He's confusing me. What do you want? Sorry. Sorry, he's um, distracting me. All right, so a little bit of salt and pepper. We can salt it again. And then I'm going to just kind of give it a little bit of cold 
water. You can also use cold white wine, but Lorenzo and I both decided we'd rather drink the wine. Yeah. Just don't. Yeah. And use water. So this is going to make it go, and make it get crunchy. Now, let me see what, this is like really hot. This might be too much. Where'd the queso fashion go? Let's see here. Okay. I think it's hot enough. How do we find out? Let me throw one again. All right, I think we're just going to let this come to temperature. So we're waiting for this to come. It looks like it's boiling on the edges, but okay, I don't want to spread a kitchen okay. fire or anything. So we're going to let Lorenzo turn the heat down. Thank you. And go to the Cachoe Pepe. Okay, boy. Ooh, All right, I'm gonna let him do cashew pepe because the pasta's ready and our oil's not ready. So off he goes. Ready? No, 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 Okay. So Lorenzo's adding bit by bit a teensy bit of uh, pasta cooking water. So the pasta cooking water contains now a lot of starch. I'm using um, I'm using linguine from Pastificio Fabri, and I'll send y'all a link where you can find some good artisanal pasta. Um, in the United States. So this is kind of a key here. Again, if you're using three ingredients, one of which is just pepper, you really want to make sure that all of your ingredients are really good quality pasta. And in this case, we're also using the pasta cooking water. So the starch that has kind of leached out of the pasta is um, one, of, one of the ingredients here. So Lorenzo's made just kind of a, like a really thick, like we said before, batter with the grated cheese, the pepper, and some of the pasta cooking water, but not very much. And obviously, it wasn't enough to overheat the cheese. shooting up to the top. I think we're See? good to go. I'm going to give the oil one more minute. No, bite. Bite. I'm going to give the oil one more minute and Lorenzo is going to do cacio e pepe. Thank you for Okay. La lascio qui perché ho bisogno. Hai Poi per porto io la Aspetta, perché ho bisogno. I, I, I need to leave pasta for a moment to cool down a little bit. This is so the cheese doesn't sink, just don't. So you want to make sure that um, the temperature that's Oops. added to the cheese isn't too hot. So notice how Lorenzo also has decided to take the pasta directly out of the pot without actually using a colander. That helps a little bit of the water get in here, and we're going to add even a little bit more water as we go on with this. There we go. We actually want the water that's attached to the pasta. It's kind of a key. Okay. All right, it's perfect. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And there we go, pasta e pepe. Lorenzo's Cacio e Pepe. So it's actually made up. I, I would put a little more pasta water in, just say in. Yeah, wait. Aqua. So the, our, this artisanal pasta, the gluten is still active, so it's like a sponge, and it absorbs any liquid that it comes into contact with, in this case, cheese sauce. And when it gets a little bit too tight, we add a little bit of water to it just to kind of loosen it back up again. Okay, I'm going to fry, and it's going to make a mess. Mm -hmm. So today I'm going to put the artichoke back in, and it's going to be a little bit of a, I think, mess. I'm losing some petals. 
The oil does need to be quite hot here for this last go round. And remember too that the artichoke, when you put it in there, actually lowers the temperature of the oil. So I'm, I'm, I'm turning it up a little bit. So, this last little bit is just to kind of give it some color and really encourage all of the petals to open up. Okay. Okay. So, here is the carchofo a la Judea. So, this is actually, I'm going to put some salt on here immediately because that's what makes anything fried so good. And this is kind of, you can get this as a side dish, but this is also really fun to have as kind of an, appet kind of an appetizer or um, an aperitivo so with a glass of um, sparkling wine, sfumante, and um, it's kind of, like I said, it's like eating potato chips. Yummy. I'm going to show y'all everything now. This is our Okay, so Lorenzo's going to plate the pasta, and I'm going to plate the other artichoke dishes for y'all. And then we can take them out, because I know I kept y'all on the plate. So the artichoke dishes are really um, side dishes. And I'm going to cover my whole kitchen fire in here. So these are the carciofi fufolati. I'm just going to show you what they look like. Um, they're nothing pretty, but again, this is kind of the base for making risotto, pasta, omelets. You can make a torta with potatoes. This already has salt, black pepper, and um, uh, parsley on it. And I'm going to add some lemon juice, which really creates an interesting effect of... Um, kind of acidity and the tannins with the artichokes and it kind of just really like makes the whole dish come together and this is really good with a piece of parmesan cheese and it's one of those dishes that somehow creates that third flavor in your mouth the artichoke the lemon and the parmesan come together just to kind of create a whole nother flavor here's lorenzo's pasta here we are you see that it's very smooth it looks excellent Lorenzo. So again, that is the simplest recipe in the world as far as the number of ingredients, but it's actually you have to have sort of some accortezze. Yeah, I show you the, the problem. If you put a lot, a lot of water, you see, this is the water and the, and the cheese is separate. You see? This is the problem with cacio e pepe. If you put a lot of water or a lot of hot water, the, the cheese separate the siero. So, this is the problem. And here are carciofi alla romana, just like just like we're in Rome. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to eat. I'm so, sorry. <laughs> all right. All of our all of our artichoke dishes, except quelli arrostiti. <laughs> okay. Here we are. That was a hint to Lorenzo to go and get our mettiamo la qua. Or no, dove la mettiamo? We'll get a new plate for him. Shall I do? Shall I do? Oh, good. Shall I do? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Okay, excellent. So these are served just right out of the flames and si vede, si vede. So the tough, the outer leaves have just kind of charred and burnt and you don't eat those. And so you just kind of peel them away and then eat the interior. And I've seen most people eat these with their fingers, by the way. Just don't. Yeah. It's finger food. Yeah, to do this. So you kind of, yeah, just take away the outer part which has been kind of just roasted by the fire. It's a little too hot. You might want to let it rest for a second. But I'm a man. I have to do it. And then you can just eat it. Can, can, <laughs> it's not possible. So that's artichokes always, you guys. And we finally got our cacio and pepe in there. So I hope you all enjoyed this. Um, I very much appreciate everybody tuning in. This is a little bit of, um, there we go. 
this is kind of an anomaly tonight. You know, Lorenzo's not always in the kitchen, um, but we wanted to do a lot of recipes, and so it's fun when he's here. So we got we kind of packed it all in tonight. So thank you all so much for for um, tuning in, and um, I will send you all the recipes tomorrow. And if anyone wants to um, undo your microphone and ask a question or have a chat, that would be great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, somebody asked wine, wine suggestions for artichokes. I know you were going to ask me that. That's a tough one. Um, wine and artichokes is kind of hard to hard match. So um, I really like, especially with the um, fried artichoke that Lorenzo is now eating, a glass of spumante. Not true. It is true. Um, glass of spumante. Or <laughs> uh, I often choose a red wine called Cesanese, which is a grape that is from Lazio. It's a very kind of a light bodied red wine. You need something that does not compete with the artichoke. Um, and so just kind of try it out. Try a white bodied red, try a good, just kind of a sparkler that that's kind of good. It kind of keeps your palate clean, usually without interfering um, too much with the artichoke. He's eating everything. No, no. <laughs> I show you only. Elaine, I'm hungry. <laughs> Elaine, what's the best artichoke we can use in the U.S.? I'm not sure what's available in the store. I know Globe, just plain old Globe artichokes are available. I think Globe. But I, would, I always encourage people ask for what you want and if you want um, a spiky artichoke which I, if you want a you know a different kind of artichoke the ones that morello that i used is there's a whole family of artichokes like that they're dark purple they have spikes and they're oblong you know take a picture take a take a screenshot on your phone and take it in there and show your um the guys who stock the vegetable uh section at your um morello at your grocery store they want to sell what you want to buy and farmers would love it if you guys would ask for these things they would love it farmers want to plant um different varieties mammal is the most common mammal it depends on where you are don't throw right. away don't throw away no no no, no, no. Oh, yeah. so elaine is this one this is a morelli right this is a morello it's oblong it has yeah, the, yeah. Uh, but is it uh, and then this is the mamale, which is one of the globe artichokes. There's several varieties of these, and there's several varieties mm -hmm. of green as well. Some of these are more green. This happens just to be a really purple one. And then these are these spiky ones, as far as I know, are generally more on the purple side. So mm -hmm. see what you can get a hold of. I don't know, some of y'all who live, you know, closer to California, maybe you can get some different varieties. Um, and again, just ask them at your grocery store. If enough people ask, they'll, they have to get it. And like I said, the farmers would love to grow something other than the plain globe artichoke. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, maybe Texas or California and Florida would do it. Exactly. Yeah. I think Watsonville in California is the artichoke capital. I know there's tons of artichokes out there. Do you, I mean, are y'all familiar? Do they only grow globe artichokes? I think only the globe, unless they're specialized. Yeah. Some uh, people will ask, and they have special farmers who do all the particulars, but you don't see a lot. Well, but it's kind of like mm -hmm. apples. You know, since when yeah. are there only two varieties of apples? There used to be hundreds of varieties of apples. You know, they, know. they're out there somewhere. I mean, the more people, the yeah. more people ask for them, the more somebody will ask the farmers yeah. to specifically, you know, grow them. So we need to all yeah, be the restaurants. Yeah. All right. So I've got the Morelli, I think. Okay. Okay. Which artichoke type would you use to make the ensalada carchofi the, the, when they're babies? To make the yeah. which? Carchofi salad. Oh, okay. The whole thing with the baby artichoke, I would use, I use this one to make carchofi salad. Actually, this is so tender, I'm kind of surprised. These are usually not quite as tender. So when I make the carpaccio, um, I use morelli. And when I make pincimonio, which is just crudite, you usually make kind of a platter just with you know raw vegetables, a selection artichoke among them, I use Morelli. These are super, super tender. They basically have no choke whatsoever. And they're, they're grown up, you know, they're grown up adult artichokes. They have no choke. Okay, that's good. Good. Good program again. Y'all, we have gone thank super you. late time. Um, but y'all, thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Very much. Thanks, we love it. We're still so hungry now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> thank you. You're both. Adios. Give me some pasta. <laughs> Bye, y'all. All right. I'll be thank you. Ciao. 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 Ciao.